Good morning to all of you. I welcome you to this session of Programming in Python Lab. In today's lab, I'll be discussing modules with you. I'll be discussing some system modules. I'll be discussing lists in Python, and we'll be writing a few programs. And uh, maybe we can work out with some uh, concepts of strings also, right? So one important thing that I wanted to discuss was, you know, just a revisit of this thing that how, you know, Python compiles its programs, right? So, you know, whenever you are executing your program, it is first compiled into something which is known as a bytecode, right? And what is bytecode? It's simply a lower level platform independent representation of your source code. And the characteristic of bytecode is that it executes fast. Right, so the idea is to enhance the speed. Okay, and uh, the bytecode is stored in a file with extension .pyc, which stands for Python compiled. Right, and if you're using version 3.2 and later, your uh, pyc file is stored in a subdirectory with the name as underscore underscore pycache underscore underscore. Okay, and it is located in the directory where your source files are residing. Okay, so I'll discuss about this uh, bytecode because that is important. And then next, <clears throat> the next part of your program execution is your interpreter, right? So when you install your Python package, uh, the minimum number of components are there, like you have an interpreter and a support library, okay? So the uh, serious scenario here, you have your program say m.py. When you compile it, it is compiled into a bytecode with the file as m.pyc. And then it is interpreted, you know, using uh, by with the help of this Python virtual machine, okay, which is simply a big code loop which goes through or iterates through each instruction in your bytecode, right? This is the idea behind it, okay. And then one more thing that I want to discuss is the concept of module, okay? What is a module in Python, okay? So uh, you see a module any file in python which ends with an extension dot py okay is a module so whatever programs you are writing they are modules in python you don't require any special code or syntax you know to make a file a module any such file which ends with an extension dot py is a module in python okay so what what you can do is you can use this module in other modules okay and that is what the program architecture in Python is, okay? The module-based services model is the program architecture in Python, okay? So what you have is when you are writing larger programs or when you are writing applications, okay? You have multiple module files which import tools from other module files. And one of these files is designated as the top level or the script file, which calls the other files, okay? So this is the program architecture in Python. Okay, uh, I'll now switch you to a uh, Python IDLE session. Let's begin a Python IDLE session here, right? So I'll write a program here for you. Let's write a program here. Say uh, A is equal to 10, B is equal to 20. And then I can write something like C is equal to A plus B and I can print the value of C. Just an example to understand what modules are. And then I'll save this file. Okay, I'll save this file uh, with the name as say P11, right? P11, I've saved it. So if I run it, obviously it will run and say sum is 30, right? So I've started with this file p11.py. So ideally, if I run it, I should have a bytecode here, okay? So let's see whether the bytecode is uh, visible or not. Okay, I'll open up this and uh, there I'll be going to my default folder. I'll look into this pycache folder. I'll look for all files. Okay, so I see here a file uh, p11. That's an older you know file. I just over over uh, wrote it, right? So we don't have our uh, bytecode here. We don't have our pyc file of today's, you know, 
session that we just created. So the bytecode file appears when you import the module once. Okay. So if I import this module here, say import p11, it would execute. And now if you look for your uh, PYC file, it would be there, right? Now, if you look for your PYC file, it would be there. You can see the timestamp here, 11 February, 9.35 AM. This is my uh, p11.pyc. And it uh, takes this uh, extension also, the current version of Python that you're using, it is also there in the nomenclature, right? Now, after this, if you try to import this again, okay, if you try to import this p11 again, nothing will happen, right? It's because uh, this import is an expensive task. Okay, this import is an expensive task. You need to, uh, you know, create the bytecode, then you need to execute, you need to put the attributes in order. So importing a, a module multiple times in a session is expensive with regards to memory. So it is allowed only once. Even if I change my, you know, even if I just uh, change my source code here, even if I write here, say, a plus B plus 10, something like this. And I save it. Okay. I've saved it. Right. Even then, if you import, nothing will happen. Okay. Nothing will happen. So one session, one import per module. Right. So, but if you want to, you know, import it again, there is a function known as reload. Okay. So what you need to do is From, I, I just let's check the file that we so this is the older version I think it should be import lib here yeah. so there is a, a function there is a method reload in the module import lib okay why I'm discussing this that is, if you want to import your module more than once in a session, you need to take the help of this reload function, right? So now you can reload like this. Okay, you may reload it any number of times. Okay, so this import is a, a statement. That is why it is, you know, this p11 is written like this. This reload is a function. So p11 is written in parentheses. And you can reload your module any number of times, right? For that, you need to use this import lib module from import lib import reload. Okay. So remember, import is an expensive task. So it is only allowed once per session, right? Now, let's see some uh, standard uh, modules. Okay. Then I'll tell you how to uh, use this module in other modules. For example, I have uh, in P11, let's, let's have a look at our P11. I have taken uh, two attributes a and b with values this and then c is this right okay so let me create another file here a new file okay and here i'll just print a message okay and here i also write import p11 right import p11 and then i can write something like say k is equal to a plus b and i would try to print the value of k right but i know that uh, this won't work okay this won't work why let's let's see first let's run it so i'm expecting the value of k as 30 10 plus 20 right so i can just name it as p23 Save it in Python, this folder. Yeah. Okay, so name A is not defined. I told you it won't run. Because you know that if you're importing P11, then uh, this A would be written like this. So you are importing this module P11 in your module P23. So if you need to use it, you must write it like this. This is one way of writing. So let's run it. So we get the sum as the value of K as 30. And uh, we, since we are importing, so whatever is there in P11 is also executed. This message is also executed, right? <clears throat> if you want to write it uh, simply like uh, A plus B, then you must write something like 
begin with say a comma b so now you are saying from p11 import these two variables so then you can directly refer to these variables like this okay so if you run it it will have the same output here right and if you have many uh, variables in your module then instead of writing all of them you can simply write a star here right so the same output is there okay so this is how you can use module one module in other modules right okay then uh, let's say now let's see uh, the path of the modules right now uh, these modules are in the same folder in my source folder okay what i'll do is uh, let let me write another new program for you right say i can write here r is equal to 100 s is equal to 200 and then i can write something like print okay and i'll save this module i'll save this module in some other drive let's say i save it in d drive right with the name as say z11 okay so now this z11 is in d drive okay so i'll run it the obviously it runs and uh, then uh, like if the current session is active i think it would import z11 also it is importing right but uh, because it it is importing from here right you are here let me close this session here let me close all the files right i've closed all the files here i'll again start the idle okay let me try now import z11 okay so it is not there because now this import it is looking at the current path okay whereas z11 module or z11.py file is present in your d drive right so how to take care of that okay so you know what we can do is we can add a particular path to our system path okay so how we can do it there is the sys module to help us with this so this is there is a sys module okay and then you can write something like sys dot path dot append okay and you can append that path there of that drive this is the syntax okay so now to the system path let's see the system path first sorry so let's see the system path you can see this is the system path the first entry is the current wherever you are located the current path then all the places where the path goes it's there and this one is the latest addition that i did right i added this to the path so that while i am importing modules it would look here also right so i can remove it also let me remove this from here so that you can see that it was not there before so i can just remove it from here okay so now if you look at system path this d is not there and now if you write here import z11 doesn't work right okay so what we can do is uh, we can append this path one way is to append okay and if after appending you write z11 then everything is fine because now it is looking in d drive also where your module is so one is you can append it now sometimes you would say you know i want this entry this path as the first thing i need to insert it at certain place right for that you can have this insert option here kindly note all these things the insert option is there and then you need to mention the position so i'm saying insert it here okay at the first position first position means this this would always remain first this current path so it would come here right okay look now you can see now it has come here here also obviously and here also right so this is how you can uh set the path for your module so that whenever you are writing import you don't face any problems okay right uh let's now take the help of uh, another file okay uh i just wanted to finish this concept of modules uh you all are aware of this factorial program okay so i'll write this factorial program right 
program to print factorial of a number right and i'll use a function for it you people have not learned functions but otherwise you are aware of what a function is so just uh, note down for the moment what is the syntax rest code remains the same so i can just make a function here with a def statement and uh, i can write something like this then i can write for i in range n okay we go from 1 to n i think n plus 1 then i would write something like f is equal to f star i and then i can write return f okay, this is a function and then i can uh, use this here say t is equal to i can input a value from the keyboard right and i can print its factorial right i can print its factorial like this like this you can call the fact function right okay so i am i have created a factorial function here if i pass it some value it would return the factorial of that value and this is how you can uh, test it here so i'll save this program uh right here with the name as fact note this thing with the name as fact so if i enter a number say 4 it will say factorial is 24 and in this current session simply because uh, you have restarted the shell if you just write something like this it will work here but the next time around when you restart the shell it won't okay so what i want to tell you is that uh, now this this is a module fact dot py okay so if you import it somewhere you can uh, use this function you can call this function okay so i'll just remove uh, this thing from here okay i'll create a new program here like this, okay and obviously to call fact here i need to write something like i'll run it in two ways import fact and then to call the fact function from the fact module you need to write like this okay so if you write like this okay okay this is a factorial okay you see because i have imported it here that's why it uh, it shows that it the it runs it twice right so in if i just close this session here and i close all the files this is test 11 and fact right okay. and then let's start another session here so if i write fact now here obviously it doesn't work because it is a part of the fact module this fact function okay so if i just load my file test 11 which is present here if i run it now you see the answer right so i have imported this and then i have called this function from within it another way would be i can write something like from fact import fact right uh, with that you know i can use fact directly without the module name right this is how you can take the help of modules okay so we have learned how we can uh, add a module path or a folder you know where your modules are to your system path you can add also you can insert it at a specific place also right and then what is the difference between a module uh, import and a module reload import is just done once a session whereas reload is done can be done multiple number of times in a session right so let's now discuss the random module in python right i'll be discussing the random module in python right so random module it has got many uh, methods obviously random module is uh, based on the concept of randomization wherein you can generate numbers randomly so a large number of methods are there 
so there is a random function okay if you use this random function in the random module it would uh, generate a float number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 okay if you use this rand int okay rand int method it would uh, pick up a random integer value from a given range okay so if you need to specify two arguments for this rand int and it would return a random integer number from within that range then random dot rand range means you know uh, you can instead of two you can go with three arguments now that is you can give a range and you can give the step size also right so the starting value stopping value and the step value right then random dot choice you know would allow you to pick some element from a non empty sequence right and random dot shuffle you already know it would reorder the elements in a list some examples i have written here for example if i use this random dot choice computer it would pick up one character from this randomly and then random dot choice if you pick up a list it will pick up one value from that list okay if you have a list if you use random dot shuffle the list would be shuffled right so that is the idea behind the random order okay so let's work out these things in our uh, ideally all right so i'll use here import random okay and if i use random dot random okay it would generate a random number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 as many times you run it to return a different number you can see that right then uh, you can use random dot randint right i can write here 10 comma 20 so it has generated 13 15 like this okay and obviously 10 and 20 both are included in the in this range then maybe you can try something like this with the step size of three so you can see now what are the possible values that it can go through it could be 10 it could be 13 16 and 19 right okay you need to change the name here i think it should be rand range right yeah okay see the permissible values Yeah, that, that, that are the only possible values in this range. Okay, so random dot rand range would mean that it would pick up a random number between 10 and 20, but going in step size of 3. So it can pick up random values from 10, 13, 16, and 19. You may increase this number here. You may write it like this. So you have a bigger range now. Right, so you know what this means. Then maybe we can write random dot choice right and you can write here python right so it would give you different answers or maybe it gives the same answers also right you never know about that so randomly it is picking up a choice from this given string then also you can specify a list here also you can specify a list right specify a list so it will pick up a number from that list randomly so this is the random module right <clears throat> so using this uh, let's see if we can uh, write you can just note down a program okay uh, generate you can write it right generate n random numbers generate n random numbers between 1 and 500 and count the number of even and odd elements, right? Okay. So this is what, you know, I want you to write this program, right? So let's now write this program. Uh, that is, uh, I just uh, close this ideally here. Restart the ideally close this also so let's write a program to uh, generate some random numbers okay and uh, say to generate n random numbers between 1 and 500 and print the number of even and 
odd elements right Just maximize the screen here. Put a comment here. Right. So obviously, the first thing that we require is to import the random module. Okay. Then I can initialize uh, these two variables like this: odd and even. Okay. Odd would count the odd numbers that are generated and even numbers which are generated. And uh, then I can input the value of n. That is how many. Numbers we need to take. Right. Enter how many numbers. Then I can go for a for loop. Prime range. Okay. You may write uh, is if you are not comfortable with this range function with a single argument, you can write this also. This would be same one to n. That is that means this loop will run n times. And if you write like this, it's the same. It will run n times, right? Within this, you can generate your random numbers. So you can call the randint function. Okay. So it will generate a random number within the range one and five hundred, right? You can check that number whether it is uh, even or odd. Okay, and you can uh, just increase the count that you've taken. So even. Is equal to even plus one, and then you can write here else. You can write here odd is equal to odd plus one. You can print the number that you've generated. You can do that also, right? And then you can print your output, right? Say something like even count is. Like this, and then you can just copy this for the odd one. Right? Okay. So this is how we can write our program. Right here. So we can just store it as random one. If you run it, obviously you'll see. That it will give you a random, you know, generation of numbers four, even, and one odd, right? So this is how you can write your programs on random numbers, and you can just see like how you have uh, used it. One import statement is there, then you are calling this random function, and obviously then you are using some conditions to get to the result that was expected out of this program. Right. Next, I will uh, discuss with you. Say lists in Python. Okay, I'll discuss the lists in Python with you. So you know, list is a sequence. Okay, which uh, which can contain elements that you represent in square brackets. Okay, and lists they are uh, mutable and mixed lists are possible. Right? By mutable means that you can change your list. You can alter your lists. Okay, immutable means something which cannot be changed. Mutable is something which can be. Changed, right? And we can have mixed list, like which was not possible in C and G plus plus. That is, you can have a list which contains integers, floats, as well as strings. Okay. So let's see, like, how we can uh, uh, create the lists. Okay. So the very basic would be to use the list constructor here. Okay. So I can use something like this. So this will generate a list of three elements. If you see the type, it will say list, right? Another way would be to, you know, directly use it like this: a is equal to. Similarly, this is again a list, right? And uh, then you can use this constructor like this: say a is equal to. You can use the list constructor here. And you can use the range function here. Okay. So here, if you write range five, so all the values from zero to four are included in the list. Similarly, if you use a string here, say if you use a string here, then each element of the string becomes a Element in the list. So this is uh, these are the different ways in which you can create lists. Then uh, if we have two lists, say I'm taking an example here for you. 
some important concept here. If a list A is there and a list B is there, right, which are having identical, you know, content, right? So if I check for A is equal to B, that means it will return you true. So two lists with similar contents, they are equivalent. We say this, there is an equivalence between them. But whether they uh, represent the same memory object, they have the same memory representation, uh, we'll check it with the is operator, right? A is B. So this will return false. Remember, any mutable object will, even if it is having similar content, two, two, two variables or two uh, sequences, if they're having similar elements, but if they are mutable, they will point to different memory pointers or memory references, right? You can check it with the ID function here. This is the memory ID for A, and this is the memory ID for B. They'll always be different, different right? Simply because uh, if they point to the same memory object, and if one of them changes, then we need to dissociate it from that object. So that is the reason that mutable sequences or mutable objects, they have different memory representations, even though they might be having the same value. But if you take the case of a string, okay? Say, if you take a string here, like this, and if you take a, another string here, like this, okay? So obviously, if I write here x is equal to y, that's true. If I write here x is y, even that would be true. Simply because when we study strings, we'll know that strings in Python are immutable. You cannot change them, all right? So that is why if two strings are having identical content, then there is only one memory object for that. So you can check it with this id one. So id of x and y would be same if they are having similar contents. Remember this, thing, right? Next is how we can access the elements of a list. Okay, that is done with the help of the index operator. So I'll take a list here to start a discussion with you all. I'm taking a list here, right? So the, here in this list, if I write here, say, this 10 is at index zero, 20 is at index one, this says two and so on. We also have negative indexes. The 60 is at index minus one, 50 is at index minus two and so on. So if I write here A zero, that is 10. If I write here A minus one, that is 60. If I write here A minus two, that is 50 and so on. So this is how you can refer to individual elements of a list using their indexes, right? And you can pick up a slice also, okay? When you talk of a slice, that means you give a starting value and an ending value. So if I write here, say, A, and then I write 3 colon 5, okay, the slice is given as starting value colon ending value. This ending value is not included, okay? So basically, I want a slice which starts from index 3, goes on till index 5, but index 5 is not included. So what is index 3? This is 0, 1, 2, 3. So this is index three, this is index four, this is index five. So I'm saying three to five, but five won't be coming in the output. So we'll have 40 and 50 as the output of this slice. And see by default, the step size in the slice is plus one, okay? So if I take a slice like this, say zero comma five, and I write a two here. Now it means starting going from zero index, up to fifth index, but fifth index not included in step sizes of two. Okay, so see the output here. Zero index is 10. Okay, and then we go to index two, that is 30. Then we go to index four, that is 50, and so on. Okay, so this is what uh, string slicing is there with step size, right? If I write something like this, this would mean the entire list. Okay, no starting value, no ending value. If I write a list like this, okay, this would mean the entire list, okay, but in reverse order, okay, with a step size of minus one, right? And what do you think about this? If I go from minus one to zero with a step size of minus one, okay? So you would be tempted to think that it will print the list again in reverse order because we are starting from minus one and we are decrementing, right? But you remember this thing that this zero is not to be included, right? So it will have print all the elements from end to beginning, but excluding the 
element with index zero. I hope this is clear. Okay, so you must understand how to pick up the slices from the strings. You must understand the index operator, right? And then let's see what we have further there. Uh, next is we can traverse a list with for and while loop. I think as programmers, uh, that should be easy for you. So simply take some variable here, say for i in take the list name, okay? And then you can simply write here print i. So it will print all the elements of the list. That's simple as that. So when you write here for i in a, it means that i will traverse each element of this list a, okay? So first it will visit 10, then 20 like this, okay? Have a look here. This is our list A, which goes, which has values 10 to 60. So if I write this code here, right, it will give you these values. Remember when you're writing this loop statements on your uh, ideally prompt, then you must print, uh, press the enter key twice to get the output, right? See here, uh, when I write like this, if I press enter once, nothing will happen. You need to press enter twice here when you're writing it on ideally prompt. Similarly, uh, you can use a while loop also for this, right? So you can use something like, uh, say i is equal to say zero, right? And then you can write here while uh, i is less than length of a. Okay, that is how many times it should uh, go through the list and then you can write uh, print A of I. That is a change in your while loop. Okay, I missed one part. An important part I missed, you know that the three parts of while loop, this was the first one, the initialization. Then uh, this was the condition part, right? This was the condition. And uh, then I printed A of I, right? And I missed this part, I is equal to I plus one. That's a dangerous one because I is, remains as zero and this condition never becomes false, right? So this was what needed to be done. I missed that I is equal to I plus one. So this is how you can traverse your lists, right? Then next is uh, the list operators plus star is in and del, right? Let's work with them. So if we have another list here, say B is equal to, uh, let's take this, say Ajay. Let's see what happens if we take like this. So this is A, this is B. Let's see what is A plus B. It will simply concatenate the lists, okay? What is A star three? You can see the output. And I hope you understand that also. What is B star four? You can see, okay? Plus would uh, concatenate your list, star would just give you a repetition of the elements in your list. Next is is and in, we have already done that, right? Then there is a del operator. So if I use say del and I use uh, a, say a zero, right? Let's see if it works like this, yeah. So the zero index element is gone, okay? And if I simply write del A, then everything is gone, right? If we have a, we don't have a list anymore. Del A would remove everything from the list, right? Let's create this list again. Let's create it like this, okay? And let's see if uh, there is an index which we are trying to remove, which is not there. It will give you some index out of range here. Yeah. So del A8, A8 is not there, so it will give you uh, index, range index sort of thing. Then you've got the inbuilt list functions, len, min, max, sum, and the shuffle function from the random module, okay? Let's see how we can use it. Length would give you the length of the list. So if you see A is this, so there are six elements. If you use min, it will give you the minimum value. If you use max, it will give you the maximum value. If you use sum, it will sum up the elements there, okay? So total of the Elements is 10 plus 20 plus 30 like this. This is 210, right? But what happens if I take a list like this? Say A is equal to 10, 20, 3.1, 4.3. If I take it like this, and again, if I use sum, it's fine. So it works between instances of inte integer and float. What if I add some string to it, right? Let's see its behavior then, okay? 
Now, if you use sum, it won't uh, uh, you know give you any results. It will give you an error because sum won't work with instances of uh, float and string, right? You can have mixed list, but then sum function won't work, min won't work, max won't work if you have strings in it. So if you try min a, if you try max a, nothing will work, right? Then shuffle, obviously, you understand if you have this list and if you use this random module here and you write random dot shuffle, then it would shuffle the elements of a, rearrange the elements of a. You can also write it like this also. If you need to use this many times in your session. Okay, you can write something like this, and then you can write like this. You can use shuffle without this. Sorry. Again, use shuffle. Again, it will shuffle like this. So anything that you need to discuss on this uh, thing, right? I think I've done all the things that are here. Next is list comprehension, okay? That's an interesting thing. Let's see what list comprehension is. So list comprehension is simply a smarter, shorter way of writing, you know, something that you need to extract from your uh, list. So the syntax for it would be, uh, you write some expression, okay? And then you use some element, okay? From some sequence with some condition, okay? Like for example, if you need to display even elements from a list, let's work with this one first. You need to work with even elements in a list. So I'll create a list for you here. Say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Say this is my list. Okay. So if I need to uh, pick the even elements here, right? So what I can do is I can write here for i in a, right? If a percentage 2 equal to 0, right? Then only I print i. Where have we lost it now? Yeah. Need to write I here. I is going through A, right? Yeah. So all are even. Okay. Let's just make a change here so that we can see it's working. Let's take this list, then write this code again. It will print the even numbers only. Now we can write it using another, uh, you know, style, a list comprehension style. So what that would be, say, let's take a list Z is equal to take some variable X or X in A if X percentage two equal to zero. So this is list comprehension, right? This is how you can write this in one line. So I've taken, see this, this is my expression or variable that variable goes through this list A, okay? And condition is that it is checking for even. So if you check for Z, it is this. This is what list comprehension is, right? So another way you wrote the same thing here with this code, okay, in three lines and this code in one line itself, right? This is list comprehension. Let's look for another, another example here. Let's generate lists A, B, and C. Three lists we need to generate such that A is a list of squares from 1 to 10, B is a list of cubes from 1 to 10, and C is a list of elements which we pick from the list A and which are even, right? Okay, from A and which are even, right? So let's see how we can generate this. Let's pick up the list A first, okay? So what is our expression now? We want squares, right? Squares of all numbers from 1 to 10. So that should be simple, use X here, use an exponent operator x square or x in you can give a range 11 range 11 or rather i should give here 1 comma 11 because we want squares from 1 to 10 right that's it okay similarly uh, cubes we need cubes so i can write here like this and i can write here the name as B. So if you check for B now, it gives you all the cubes from one to 10. And the next thing is you want uh, something from C elements in A and which are uh, even. So that is the same code that we wrote here. Say C is equal to, uh, we want X for X in A. So this will go through the list A and 
it will check for even with this code right if you print c it gives you all the elements from the list a but only those which are even right so this is how list comprehension can be done okay so just a shorter way a smarter way of writing your code which you can otherwise write with your uh, for or while loops right all right that's the end of today's session and uh, we had a very good discussion on modules and on lists and in my next uh, discussion with you we'll be working on strings in python so till that time just keep watching my videos thank you very much